started screaming and slammed the phone. How is this even possible? Because she tells the police she checked and checked and checked and checked. If anybody jeopardized my job, I will and he went like this, and he went. It was, it was horrifying. my beautiful friends. Welcome to True Crime Wine Wednesday. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. Every time I say that, I feel like I get a different accent. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single Wednesday. I love and I appreciate you so much. You, yes, you. I'm just sending you the screen, the screen, the, scre the screen squeezes. I have a quick question before we get into the video today. I'm going to keep it quick. Don't you worry, okay? I know I, I know I ramble. But I was just kind of thinking about my Instagram and stuff. I'm not super active on there. I try to share, you know, a little bit of behind the scenes, just my life sometimes with my hubs or like the kids. One thing I do want to acknowledge, I'm going off track here, about my children is that I do show the two youngest. I do have an older daughter who is super camera shy, but I do see a lot of comments and it hurts my feelings sometimes when people ask like, where's Haley? Why isn't Haley photographed? Why don't you photograph Haley? And I'm like, I do photograph Haley. I'm just not allowed to show the photos. I love her so much. But I just kind of wanted to share that in case you also, you know, had the same concern. But anyways, the Instagram question. I kind of want to know what you would like to see on Instagram. I kind of have two ways I can go here. I'm thinking of maybe posting more about my everyday makeup or fun makeup looks that you want me to recreate if I've had it in a video. I do get a lot of questions about, oh, how did you do this look? my hair, all that type of stuff, maybe even outfit inspo. I don't know. I get a lot of feedback about those things on my channel. And then clearly this isn't a beauty channel, but I thought maybe it can work for Instagram. Or I was also thinking to stay with, you know, my niche. I could do, you know, one minute or two minute summaries on reels about the cases that I'm doing that week. I want to hear from you. I, I want to know what you guys think. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I have one more quick message for you before we get started. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to PDS Debt for partnering with us again and sponsoring today's video. I know there are so many of you out there feeling the same way that I did, wishing there was a better solution out there to pay off your debt. Interest fees alone are so overwhelming. And one thing I love about PDS Debt is that they have customized a 0% interest rate option for anyone struggling with credit card debt, personal loans, collection agencies, or even medical bills. Did you know that because of the tough times during COVID, certain types of debt can be reduced or paid off much faster, which saves you thousands in interest. PDS Debt is giving our Dales a free debt saving analysis just for completing their 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash dale. You will receive a full breakdown showing you how you're gonna save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. If you are like I was and you are making payments every single month and your debt is not going anywhere, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one zero 0% interest, low monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit is accepted. It's the saving thousands in interest and fees and the option to pay off your debt in a fraction of the time that gives me relief that there's a program like PDS Debt out there to help people who are so overwhelmed with debt like I have been in my life as well. Like I said, PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash dale. That's pdsdebt.com slash dale. You can take back your financial freedom today by visiting www.pdsdebt.com slash dale. Okay, riddle time. Walking on the living, they don't even mumble. Walking on the dead, they mutter and grumble. What are they? Super pumped to hear your answers on this one. Felicity, why do you want to leave me? No, you stay with me. You wanna go? I'm very sad. <laughs> all right, grab your drinks, grab your snacks, get all cozy. Today, I am drinking a Beebs brew. <laughs> Bebe my baby. I'm also super invested in their relationship though to his and his wife, Haley Bieber. My obsession from Justin Bieber turned into my obsession with him and Haley Bieber. So I can't get enough of this uh, whole Tim Hortons Biebs collab. And so yeah, this is pretty much what I decided I'm gonna live on for the next however long they keep it. All right, today we're talking about a case that I think about often. It's another one of those that I, I think I saw for the first time on Dateline or 48 Hours. And through the years, I've always 
always kind of gone back to revisit it because I I just can't comprehend that there are people out there that are this diabolical. I mean, we've talked about some heartless people on the channel, but what happened to 41-year-old Frank Rodriguez might be one of the top coldest things I've ever heard of. Jose Francisco Rodriguez, who went by Frank, was born on February 16th, 1959 in El Paso, Texas. He was the second oldest of six kids and the born leader of his family. His father grew up in Mexico and was a doctor there, but when they moved to Texas, he had to take a job as an orderly. When Frank was young, the family relocated to Illinois where Frank's father eventually left his wife and his six children, but his mom didn't skip a beat. She was a hardworking, very dedicated woman who did the best that she could to provide for her family. Frank is described as having a dry sense of humor. He loved to make people laugh and was always playing pranks on his family. Also was a big sports guy. He loved football, loved some baseball too. After graduation, he joined the Navy and he also married very young. His wife did really struggle with the fact that he was gone for long periods of time, but when he was offered a bonus, if he re-enlisted and moved to San Diego, she thought, okay, I might be able to get on board with this because we're gonna be living in San Diego. Ultimately though, it was too much pressure on their relationship and she did leave Frank. And after his marriage ended, he really felt lost in his life. He felt like he was starting from scratch both professionally and personally. He worked some odd jobs here and there. He worked as a paralegal assistant at one time. Another job he had was an assistant for a plumber. So he was trying these different things, but he just wasn't feeling like any of them were leading him to what his purpose was. He did enjoy his time in the Navy, but he wanted something that was a little bit more stable, had a little bit more flexibility. His goal was to hopefully get remarried and have children. So he thought the best way to do what he loves and attain those goals, which was to join the National Guard. Here he started finding his footing again, and then a friend reached out to him and told him about an opportunity where he could get hired as a sergeant at a place called Angel's Gate Academy in San Luis Obispo. Once he heard about this opportunity, this felt like the perfect fit for him. At Angel's Gate, he got to work with children who were headed in the wrong direction. He was firm but fair and it made him very respected by the kids. I think a part of that was also that he respected them in a sense too. It gave him this purpose in life and it meant so much to him to help kids, which I'm sure was a relief for a lot of the students that went to Angel's Gate. These boot camps often use intimidation, abuse, humiliation. The idea is that these tactics are going to intimidate you into being a better teen. And as we're learning more about really what happened behind closed doors of these types of academies and schools, it's not aging very well. Finding out a lot of the details that happened is really quite disturbing. My understanding, I don't know if that had changed at some point, but while Frank was there, it sounds like out of all of these types of schools, boot camps, Angel's Gate was one of the better ones. Again, I'm not sure how accurate that was, but according to the students who had Frank as their sergeant, they said that he was always the good guy, the good cop that they could rely on. There was always the good cop, bad cop type of sergeants, and Frank was the one who was very empathetic to their situation. He would also do things like reward them by taking them on excursions to the beach. They'd get to go kayaking, just do things that they never got to do in their life up until this point before. Being this person for the kids, feeling like he was making a difference, really reignited his zest for life again, and it also made him want to be a dad even more than he did previously. One thing to know about Frank is he was a very religious man, big fan of baby Jesus, and so he always turned to his faith just to guide him in the direction that he needed to be on. And one of his daily prayers was that he would find the right woman and have a family. So when he meets this woman at work named Angeline Morales, he thought his prayers had been answered. She had been in the military, she was a devout Christian, and she had a nine-year-old daughter. So he was already thinking he's got this feeling of a family. Angelina was born Angelina Calio Cavo in 1968 in Queens. She grew up in a rough neighborhood with her mom and her older sister. Her mom was a nurse and her dad was in and out of the picture while she was growing up. When he was around, he worked odd jobs here and there, but any of the money that he made never really went to the household. So it was her mom that was the one that was left to keep a roof over their heads and work to provide for her children. It was rare that she did have time to do things for herself, but she did find time on most Mondays to attend bingo. While she was there, she would drop off the girls at 
at her father's house, their grandfather. I just want to give a trigger warning for child abuse and sexual assault. If it's something that you struggle with hearing, just fast forward a little bit ahead of the video. I do want to mention though, there will be some reference to this later on in the video. If, if that's too heavy for you, definitely feel free to stop watching now. When their mom left them with their grandfather, he would subject them to watching him touch himself. They were really young and they didn't know what was going on, but they knew just from natural instinct that it wasn't right. Angelina's older sister did mention this to their mom, but she couldn't accept it and just kind of brushed it off like, no, that's... It's not what you're seeing. At one point, Angelina tried to go and speak to her grandmother about it. And allegedly a week after she told her this, she died. The next person she went to was her uncle. And a week after she told him, he also passed away. I couldn't find information on this. I don't know if it was, you know, they couldn't handle hearing about it and decided they didn't want to be around anymore. I don't know if it was a heart attack from stress of understanding this. All I know is they both passed away after she had talked to them about this and it made Angelina decide that she didn't want to talk to anybody about anything serious anymore because she thought she was the cause of people that she cared about dying after she was talking about her trauma. Unfortunately, this allowed the abuse to carry on for years. Eventually, it got to the point where as she got older, it just kind of turned into one of those situations where Angie got whatever she needed from her grandfather because he wanted to keep her quiet. The sad part about this is that it sounds like a lot of people were aware of what was going on in the family, but they just turned a blind eye to it. They didn't want to acknowledge that their suspicions were actually true. It got to the point where her grandfather was almost not even trying to hide the fact that there was abuse going on. He was very touchy with her in front of people. It was really hard for me to read about. It made me sick at times. Allegedly, she was impregnated twice by him and he had to pay for her her abortion. This led Angelina to become very rebellious. Anything to go against the grain, she did. She also fell into a very deep depression and several times throughout her life, she attempted to take her life. When she was 19 years old, she married for the first time. She married a guy named Hector. And I'm sure there was an element of doing this to just escape her upbringing, start something of her own, maybe feel protected by somebody else. Unfortunately, that relationship didn't even last a year. And so her next escape was joining the Air Force. When she was there, she met another cadet named Tom and they quickly had two children and got married. They had two daughters, but tragically in September, 1993, their 13 month old baby named Alicia passed away when she choked on her pacifier. This tragedy put a lot of strain on the marriage and it got to a point that unfortunately she and Tom, they couldn't recover, so they divorced. Briefly after Tom and her marriage, she did remarry, but it only lasted a couple months. And this is around the time that she also got a job at Angel's Gate and met Frank Rodriguez. It sounds like the sparks flew very instantly. Right away, Frank told his family, I met the woman that I'm gonna marry and everyone was super excited for him. Same went for the people in Angelina's life. Even her ex, the father of her children, Tom, he couldn't say enough nice things about Frank. He had no problem with him being around his daughter. He thought he was a very good match for Angelina and just all around thought he was an, a really great guy. They met in February and by April, they got married. Something I thought that was really touching and sweet was at their wedding, he also made vows to Angelina's daughter that he was gonna be the best husband he could for her mother and also the best stepfather he could be to her. When I see those videos, oh my God, they just get me, get me. Now, not long after this quick marriage and relationship, Angie and Frank left Angel's Gate. There was some drama that was going on behind the scenes. Angie had accused one of their bosses, another sergeant at Angel's Gate of inappropriate relationships with some of the students. This ended up causing a lot of strain at work, also a big rift in the friendship that Frank had with this man. And so not long after the wedding, he was offered a teaching job in LA and he left Angel's Gate with Angelina. Although he left though, there was still camaraderie, there was still a connection, he was still in the school world and the teaching profession. So often they would kind of do collaborations throughout schools with Angel's Gate that if they saw students who might need different direction, they would recommend them going there. And then some of these teachers would even chaperone to make that whole process a little bit more seamless. And so in early September, 2000, this is what Frank did. He 
had some of his students and he was escorting them to go out and spend some time at Angel Gate. He was only there to escort them there that day and then came back that evening. When he came back, Angelina said that Frank was really sick. And four days after, at 3 a.m. on September 9th, 2000, Angelina calls 911 when she found Frank unconscious on the floor. When paramedics arrived, Angelina's outside. They come into the house and they see him just face down, unresponsive, and it was too late by the time they got there. Frank had passed away. Pretty early on, her speculation was that when Frank left to Angel's Gate, somebody had done something because of these accusations that she brought up caused a lot of tension and somebody was wanting to get retaliation. So Angie's account of what happened was that on Tuesday, Frank left at about 5 a.m. to escort this group of children and he was home by 9.30 that night. She said when he got home, he was very groggy and tired. On Wednesday, he tried to go to his teaching job but ended up coming home early because he was starting to feel really sick. And then that night she said he was violently ill from you know, both, both ends. He couldn't keep anything down. He was really weak and it got to the point where he couldn't even move. That evening she brought him to the ER and the doctor did an exam, he ran some precautionary tests, but he said that there wasn't anything that was showing up. There was no issues in his kidney, which what which they were concerned about. So they sent him home saying that it was probably just a really bad bug and he just needed a lot of fluids and a lot of rest. Angelina brings Frank back home. They followed instructions, loaded up on the Gatorade. She's making him soup and crackers. Even that's not working though. It's getting to the point where he's sick every 10 to 15 minutes, but he's just insistent like, this is gonna be the worst of it. Usually it gets worse before it gets better and I'm gonna be okay. That night she fell asleep on the couch and then she said she woke up around 3 a.m. and wanted to check on Frank and make sure he was okay. When she went into the bedroom, she found him on the floor, unresponsive. It looked like he had gotten up to go to the washroom maybe and then just passed out. When the autopsy was performed, there was no signs of anything that could have caused this. Everything came back that he was really healthy. There was no sign of stroke, heart attack, overdose, which made the whole situation even harder for everybody to deal with, especially Angelina. She was a mess. She called Frank's family almost every single day to talk about how brokenhearted she was and that without a reason for the cause of death, she was not able to accept that it even happened. His family was kind of like, you know, some sometimes these things just happen and we don't have answers. We just have to, you know, trust in God and that's what Frank would have wanted us to do. But very quickly, her suspicions turned to the fact that she thought he was poisoned when he left to go to Angel's Gate. Again, everyone around her is just trying to calm her down. They're like, it's natural for, you know, your mind to wander. You're just trying to make sense of something that isn't making sense to you. And they keep reiterating that there's no proof that anything malicious had taken place and that anybody had poisoned him. She was adamant though, and she started calling the police station and putting pressure on the officers there to have a detective come and look at his case. Eventually, homicide detectives decided to take a look. It was almost just to appease Angelina, give her some closure to say, okay, we've looked at this and there's nothing there. They do a formal interview with her and this is where she goes over this, the same story that she had been sharing with his family where he went on this trip to Angel's Gate and she felt like somebody had done something there. And they say, okay, you know, what makes you think of that? And she said when she had reported the suspicions about this sergeant who had inappropriate relationships with the students there, they had made a threat to whoever it was that Put these allegations against them. Allegedly, there were a bunch of staff in a lunchroom and this person who was accused said, if anyone costs me my job, I'll kill them. She said then they made a, you know, hand gesture that was a gun and pointed it to Frank and was like, she said that when Frank told her he was going up to escort the children, she begged him not to because of the tension there. But he was the kind of guy who did anything for not just kids, but anybody. He's, he was the type of guy that would just give the shirt off of his back because. She said when Frank got back from the trip, everything went great according to him. Frank said the staff were really excited to see him again, happy to be working with him again. There was no tension. Angelina said that he even stayed for a few minutes after he dropped the kids off to have some cookies in the staff room. Staff room? Rum? Not rum. Staff room and Gatorade. As she started looking back and thinking about what Frank said happened that day that he was there, she suspected that when he went and had those snacks in the staff room, somebody did something to them then. Obviously, the detectives ask, okay, well, who do you think did this then? And Angelina tells them Sergeant Holloway. This is the man who was Frank's boss, 
one time very good friend and also the man that she suspected of having inappropriate relationships with the students. So the detectives go to Angel's Gate and they want to interview the staff, see if they have any suspicions themselves about Sergeant Holloway. And the people they talked to said that on that day that Frank was there, they didn't see anything suspicious, but they knew that Sergeant Holloway was really upset about the accusations. Now he was still working at Angel's Gate because those accusations were investigated thoroughly and they were proven false. But investigators think, okay, well that doesn't necessarily mean anything because accusations stay with you. Even if they are proven false, that's something that once it's out there, you can't take it back. And there's always gonna be somebody who kind of has that, well, was there some truth to it or not? When they speak with Sergeant Holloway, he does admit, yeah, I was totally pissed. And I think I did probably say whoever said this about me, I'm gonna kill them. The problem was is when he did say that, he didn't know who had accused him of it. He did find out later on that it was Angelina, but at the time he had no idea. And as far as it came to serving him cookies and poisoned Gatorade, it was impossible for him to have been the one who to do it because at that point in the day, he wasn't even there in the room with Frank. It's not to say that it was impossible. Obviously there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to thoroughly investigate everything. And this was something that Angelina really struggled to accept and come to terms with. With, she called the investigators pretty much every other day to find out where things were at. Her main question was usually where things were at with the coroner's office. Did they have an answer for her yet? And the detective explains to her, it doesn't, you know, work like on TV. There's not this universal test that they can just plug in all of the tissue samples in and it can just say, bing, this is what it is. It's not like diagnostics in a car where you just run it and then it can show you what the issues are. They need to know what they're specifically testing for to find out if they can find it or not. And the coroner that was conducting Frank's autopsy, he wasn't an amateur. This man had done over 4,000 autopsies. So he knew what he was doing. He just needed to know what direction to go into. Even though Frank's family initially were feeling like Angelina was overreacting, letting her mind get away from her with this whole poisoning murder plan, plot, suspicions. The detectives needed some help from them and when they interviewed Frank's sister, she remembered a conversation that she had with Angelina when she said, okay, well, you know, who has access to poison? You know, if he's poisoned, how does that happen? And Angelina says, there's so many ways that somebody can be poisoned. You could be poisoned by the flower that grows on the side of the road. His sister says, what flower? And Angelina says it's called oleander. She didn't think too much of it then, but then she said when they were in the limo on the way to Frank's funeral, there was oleander on the side of the highway and she points it out to everybody and says, there, that's oleander. Once the detective heard this, he felt, okay, we have maybe a place to start now. He started taping his conversations with Angelina and again, he's just reiterating to her, unless we have something specific, we can't test for it. So in order for us to expedite his cause of death, we really need to know what it could be. We're here because we understand there's a pub. You have some information or believe there's a possibility that your husband was poisoned. Yes, sir. Okay. Like Angelina said with his sister, she tells the detective, yeah, I don't know what it could be. I mean, it could be a number of things. It could be the flower that grows on the side of the road. And he says, oh, flower on the side of the road? What's that? Because he needs her to say the word. Unfortunately, she doesn't though. She just says, yeah, um, yeah, what are they called? I think they're called azaleas or something. She wouldn't say oleander, but a few days later, she calls the detective and she says that around 8 a.m. she got this anonymous call from somebody. She didn't know who it was and they said they didn't want to share that because they were scared of Sergeant Holloway. But this person overheard Sergeant Holloway say, they'll never pin it on me. And then she said the line started breaking up, but all she could make out towards the end was ask them to look for antifreeze. So they're like, antifreeze? We were just uh, talking about Oleander. Now we're on antifreeze. What the heck is going on? So with the tips from his sisters naming Oleander, and now Angelina talking about this call, suggesting they look for antifreeze, they do have something to go off of for the coroner to specifically test against. And sure enough, when the toxicology report comes back, it comes back with high levels of ethylene glycol, AKA antifreeze, and there was some oleander in his system as well. With this, the detectives pop by, they wanna look around, see if there is any antifreeze in the house, maybe some oleander hanging around. 
When they went there, she wasn't home, but they did notice this big trash bag on the front lawn. Obviously they took it. I mean, if you're a detective, why wouldn't you? And inside of it, so sad, it was all of Frank's things. She had thrown out so many important things that he had done in his life, like medals that he had earned, his uniforms from his time in the Navy. You know, things that you would be really proud of as a wife to keep on and have as his memory or even pass it on to his family. I mean, that's not evidence that she did anything. It's just that she's kind of a bit heartless in my opinion. But when they went to the backyard, they did find something that they thought was bringing them closer to figuring out who was responsible for Frank's death because their neighbor had this big oleander bush and a big part of it was coming over on their side of the fence. Unfortunately, this isn't enough for them to arrest her and have a case stick and they needed to start moving really fast because not long after this she decided to move a few hours away so the detectives go back to sergeant holloway and they say listen you are definitely being pushed as the person who's responsible for this and we need your cooperation not in terms of confessing and telling us what you, you did and how you did it but we need you to reach out to the person who is accusing you plot twist they wanted to see what she would do and say if he actually reached out to her. And they say, don't worry, anything she says is not gonna be held against you because we are going to have a recording of exactly how the conversation is going. He's game, he calls Angelina, they're listening. When she picks up, he gets straight to it. He just says, Angelina, why'd you tell the police I poisoned Frank with antifreeze? And she's like, who is this? How did you get this number? And he says, this could ruin my life. To which she replied, you need to deal with the investigators. I'm hanging up. She hangs up and you'd think she had the detectives on speed dial. Less than a minute later, she calls them and says, I just got a phone call from Holloway. He said to me, why are you telling the police about antifreeze? You better watch your back and stop talking to them or else. And the detectives, like he threatened you? And she's like, yeah, I am scared to death. Death, just all the telltale signs of a master manip manipulator, somebody taking something and then twisting it and embellishing to make it fit their narrative. And this is a pattern that she did a lot in her life. She manipulated any situation to get what she wanted. People who worked at Angel's Gate said that there was a time before she had her eye on Frank, that she had her eye on a different sergeant and this guy was a cowboy. So when she found this out, she was a cowgirl. She had the records, the cowboy hat, she dressed like Patsy Cline. And when this guy said he was not at all interested, she set her sights on Frank, who was very religious. And then all of a sudden she was in full worship mode. Honk for Jesus, bumper sticker. <laughs> bumper sticker. <laughs> oh, Sherilyn. She had a Bible in the car, went to church every Sunday, the whole thing. On top of the help from Sergeant Holloway, the detectives also got some help from Angelina's best friend. She reached out to the detectives to talk to them about some conversations that the two of them had that as she was thinking about them more weren't sitting right. She admitted that she knew that Angelina was having an affair behind Frank's back with her nephew, not Angelina's nephew, but her best friend's nephew. And when she asked Angelina why she wouldn't just divorce Frank since she had already been divorced in her life, she said, no, Frank has an insurance policy. And if I decide one day I wanna kill him or something, I'd get a lot of money. I guess when she said this, she was with her best friend at her best friend's mom's house and her mom was also there. And they just kind of took the comment as, well, she's clearly joking. And the conversation shifted to, okay, well, like if you were going to, how would you do it? And her best friend's mom talked about this recent Law & Order episode, I believe, or maybe CSI, where this wife had poisoned her husband with Oleander. Her best friend said, looking back after her mom had said this, Angie had a lot of questions about the flower. Then things just start stacking up against her. They find out that only eight hours after Frank had died, Angie called their insurance agent uh, to let him know that Frank was dead and that she wanted to cash in on his $250,000 life insurance policy. What Angie didn't know though, is that in order for a policy to pay out, there needs to be a cause of death. And this kind of put everything into alignment because there's kind of that question in the back of the detective's heads that, okay, if she is the one who did this and 
th th this is how she did it. Why is she so adamant and in contact with us and leading us to exactly what to look for and catch her? It's because she needed the reason to get paid out and she thought if she pushes it on Chad, he'll be the one who's blamed for it. With all of this unfolding behind the scenes, luckily she's still actively involved in the investigation and she's definitely really still pushing this Sergeant Holloway narrative. And the detectives keep telling her, you know, we're super close. We're, we're, we're right there to arrest him. We just need a couple more things so that there's no reasonable doubt. And one of the things we're struggling connecting is how Sergeant Holloway knew that Frank was going to be one of the chaperones to bring these children to Angel's Gate because there's always just different chaperones that are coming and going. People don't just drive around with antifreeze in their car hoping that their arch nemesis is gonna just show up at their job, you know? She tells them there has to be record of it and just to reach out to Angel's Gate because she knew how the system operated and there's usually a sheet, like a sign-in sheet that says who's coming and going. She also requested that she be there when Sergeant Holloway was arrested so that she could see the look on his face. A couple days after she provides this information to reach out to get this fact sheet, they say, oh, they, they can't locate it. We're not really sure if one exists. And what do you know it? A couple weeks later, this fax comes through right to the detective's desk. It's a fax that was sent from a Staples that was about a block away from Angelina's house. And the cover sheet is this big, messy written note. And it says that there's this roster sheet that is to follow in the next fax that they think is gonna be useful and why is Holloway still on the streets? Sure enough, there is a sign-in sheet and then Frank's name is circled on it. And with this, she has provided the last piece of their case that they need to make an arrest. They had seen the original sign-in sheet and it never said Frank's full name. I believe it just said F. Rodriguez. I suppose somebody could put two and two together, but the fact that it was altered to really push this and then sent from the staples by her house, it was pretty obvious what was going on here. Every time they had a question, every time there was a missing piece to the case, she was the one to provide it. They get an arrest warrant and they make a phone call to her to let her know, okay, we finally have the last piece of the puzzle to arrest Holloway. And as promised, we're on our way to your house to come and pick you up so that you can watch it all go down. She's stoked. When they get there, she invites them in. I guess she invited them to have a cup of coffee and the detectives were like, we're good. And so they sit down, they're chit-chatting for a little bit and then they just say, it couldn't be Sergeant Holloway. The only person who knew anything about Oleander and Annie Freeze was you, boo-boo. You are the sole person who closed this investigation because you had every answer to the questions that we had. To top it off, the level of the poisons that were still in Frank's system indicated that he would have needed to ingest it within hours of him dying. And he had already been home from Angel's Gate for a couple days, so it couldn't have been anybody who was there. The detectives had also pulled her phone records from that very first phone call where she said to look for antifreeze, and there was never an incoming phone call that morning like she said there was. As they're feeding this to her, she's just expressionless and silent. They ask her to stand up, and she's like, are you gonna arrest me? They say yes, and she starts crying. She's like, no, I didn't kill my husband. As they're putting the cuffs on her, it's almost like a tantrum she's having. She's like, uh, I swear I didn't do it. It's almost, it's really cringy to watch actually. It's quite embarrassing. She's hauled off, she's tossed in the slammer, but unfortunately this didn't really teach her anything. While she's in there, she befriended her cell neighbor and she tells her she wants to take somebody out for betraying her and getting her arrested and doesn't want them to testify. Surprisingly, it wasn't Sergeant Holloway. It was her best friend. She says she would pay $30,000 to have her killed, but she needed it to look like an accident or a suicide or that her best friend's boyfriend did it with Annie Freeze. So there was reasonable doubt in their case to say, okay, everyone thought she was this Annie Freeze killer, but look, somebody close to her is killing with Annie Freeze. At one point, she even suggested that they make it look like a gas explosion and blow the house up. Even if her children who looked at Angelina like an aunt were in there, just heart, heartless, zero heart. Thankfully, this friend went to the guards and told them about everything. They were able to record the phone conversation to have enough evidence against her, but they wanted to make sure that she didn't have anything to go back on. They wanted to make sure that she was really serious about this. So this friend arranges the hit. They go to Angelina's best friend. They say what she's 
trying to do to her. And they have this makeup artist come and have this bullet wound to the side of her head. They take photos looking like she was killed. And then a few days later, the, the hitman or this associate of the hitman comes to the jail, meets with Angelina, but it's an undercover cop and he just shows her this picture. Angelina looked really surprised. She was like, oh my God, where did you get these? I thought, I thought my cellmate was kidding. I didn't actually think that she could do this. And then a few minutes later, she's super excited that this happened because all of a sudden she can go home because her best friend can't testify anything at the trial. At the trial, the prosecution believed that initially she just wanted to poison Frank with Oleander, but it wasn't happening fast enough. And when the doctor had sent him home from the ER suggesting fluids, she started putting antifreeze in his Gatorade. The jury found her guilty of first degree murder in Frank's case. Unfortunately, they were unable to come to an agreement in the attempted murder charge. At the sentencing phase, she spoke to the judge and said that she didn't get her chance to tell her side of the story. She suggested that Frank was the one who was responsible for his death and not her, and that he knew a lot about poisons and decided to take his own life by putting antifreeze in his drink himself. He didn't believe it, and in October 2003, she was sentenced to death, and she is still on death row to this day. This is something that Angelina and her family strongly deny, but at the sentencing phase, the jury was able to learn more about her first daughter who died in this tragic pacifier accident, and they learned that not only did Angelina have a life insurance policy on her daughter, who's a baby, but they also learned that she sued the soother company for over $700,000 and one. The whole story behind the soother incident just made the hair on my arm stand up. And I'm French. I got a lot of hair on my arm. Basically what happened a few days before the accident, they were at a restaurant and there was somebody who was having dinner at the same restaurant and noticed the soother that the baby had and felt compelled enough to come up to the table and say, hey, I think that soother is on recall just so you know. And according to Angie's husband, Tom, at the time, he said Angie was like, oh, really? And asking all of these questions about it. And he believed that after this was brought up, the soother was thrown out, but it wasn't. Days after she finds this out, a, a $50,000 life insurance policy was taken out on her baby. She makes herself the beneficiary. And the day after the policy comes into effect on September 18th, 1993, she puts her daughter down for a nap, checks on her an hour later and finds her unresponsive. When she called 911, she went outside of the house and waited for them on the front lawn. The first responders there all found that very odd because any other choking case that, that they had been on, the parent was in hysterics with the baby in their arm, desperately trying to unlodge whatever was in their throat. Now there was a recall on this soother. However, an expert was hired to look at the pieces. They still had them because Angie demanded that the paramedics give them back to her so that she could use it in her lawsuit. So this allowed them to see how it would have become unattached and it looked like it had been almost cut and then to the point where the baby could detach the rest of it and choke. If that's true, diabolical doesn't even describe the woman. All I can say is thank goodness this woman is so narcissistic to the point that she was the one to push an investigation. Really, this easily could have been unsolved and she would have gotten away with murder, but she wanted the money so bad she thought that her leading the detectives in this little bread crumb trail that she was laying down for them, they wouldn't pick up on it. I, I don't know. But thank goodness she thought she was smarter than everybody because she's the one who landed herself in jail and there's no better karma than that. I will say that I do hate that she had to go through what she did in her upbringing. No one should ever have to do that, but we've said this time and time again on the channel. It just, it's not an excuse to be this evil. This is evil, evil. All right, you guys, that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. You know I love and I appreciate you so much answer to today's riddle. I'm so excited for you guys to figure out if you got it right and I can't wait to hear your answers. Quick reminder, walk on the living, they don't even mumble. Walk on the dead, they mutter and grumble. What are they? And the answer is leaves.
It makes so much sense, right? And for the record, no, I did not get it right. <laughs> I don't get any of them. All right, I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.